We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. It's on now. Hey, church. All right. How's everyone doing today? I want to say welcome to all the people in the room and all the people in the lounge and all the people watching online as well. Uh, sorry you missed the first 15 seconds of me fumbling with my microphone, but we're still going to have a good time today. Hey, I do want to point out to you, uh, it, well, first of all, I'll tell you, if, you have, if we have not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at, at ACC, but if we have not had a chance to meet, I'd love to meet you at some point. It's often hard for me to get to meet some of the new families because by the time I get out there, Everyone's like spread out, picking up kids or, or in the parking lot already. Uh, but we have about 35 or so, or maybe a little bit more than that, uh, men that you would typically see here in the room still in Virginia. They're, they're, uh, right now they're in the middle of a service and they went on a men's retreat and uh, a few of us came back early to be with you guys today. Uh, but it, it was an incredible time of, of being in God's presence and, and learning to walk with, God, with Christ and what it meant to, 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 uh, to, to man up, essentially. And so I will say, I brought a stool out here because I got back real late last night, and uh, that's going to help me. I, I slept on a piece of wood, basically, and uh, I'm in pain, so don't mind me if I sit down every so often. Uh, so let's get into our, our message. As Sarah said, we are starting a series called Rhythms, um, and we're talking specifically today about rhythms of worship, and I'm excited about talking uh, about this series in general, but about, about talking to you about rhythms of worship today. How many of you know that whether you realize it or not, you all have a rhythm to your life? Would you all agree to that? Some of you probably think, oh, I don't have a rhythm. I just kind of wake up and do what I want for the day. Well, that might be your rhythm. Uh, I have a rhythm to my life. My rhythm is pretty, it's one of those rhythms that if I don't do it, I feel terrible all day. And, then, and my wife has to hear about it. She's like, so I, I wake up before most people um, and I go to the gym. Most people would be like, no, you don't wake up in the morning. You wake up at night um, and you go to the gym. Because I go at like five o'clock in the morning. It's still dark. There's nobody at the gym except for the, the same few meatheads that are there every morning, you know. Um, and we just lift weights, and there's no one in our way. And so I, I start my day like that, and then I, I get Matt, my, my kid Maddie to the bus stop, and then I, I, I try to say bye to Michelle before she goes to work, and then I come to work, and I go home, and I spend time with them. That's my rhythm. If you don't know what your rhythm is, if you're married, ask your spouse, because they'll tell you, oh, you do this every day, you do this, you do this, and you do this. It annoys me. Can you stop doing this? They'll tell you what your rhythm is. But a lot of people tend to think that a rhythm is, uh, is musical, right? You tend to think that, you know, as we have a metronome on our screen for the series graphic, you tend to think that a rhythm is that little click that you hear on a metronome that's going doop, 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 doop. And, and it's kind of setting the beat or the, the rhythm, essentially is what we would describe it in music even. It's setting a beat uh, for the beats per minute, you know, if you know any, any musical terminology, the BPM. But that's not all of what a rhythm is. A rhythm is simply a, a, a pattern. It is a, a repeated pattern that happens on a regular basis. But everyone in this room has one, whether you know it or not. So today we're going to be talking about rhythms of worship. You know, just a few weeks ago, we had an incredible time at a, a night of worship called Dwell. And we all got to, to spend time learning about what it meant to dwell in God's presence. And we got, to, uh, we got to witness three spontaneous, completely unplanned baptisms that were amazing to be a part of. If you know the stories behind one of them in particular, then you would know that it was an incredible time. Uh, but I, I'm excited about talking and opening up this series, talking about rhythms, because I truly believe that what we experienced during that night of worship is something that you, you should be and you could be experiencing every day of your life. It's not something that is, that is set apart just for a night of worship. It should be something that is so ingrained in your life 
that you plan your day around a routine that revolves around God. You don't plan your routine and your rhythm around your job and your family, and then God kind of fits in that. That's backwards. Uh, you know, it says in, let, let's, let's read a scripture real quick, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into the message. But it, it says in Revelations 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we, we love you. God, we pray, Lord, that we would be able to, to develop a rhythm in our lives to where we are worshiping you and we are growing closer to you on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, I will start by telling you, you and I were all created to worship. That's the purpose. That's the heart of why you were created we were created, as Revelation 4.11 said, we were created to give glory to God, to give honor to God because of, of one thing, is that he is worthy. He alone is worthy of our praise. You know, a rhythm of worship is what we have been designed to have. Now, our sinful nature, our egos, our arrogance, our, our, uh, our human minds, the way that we think, the way we're wired, whatever you want to say about them, you know, we are, essentially, we are born into a broken uh, nature, a broken world, right? If you go back to Genesis and you read the, the account of Adam and Eve, you'll know that the way that they were designed it could be still the way we were living, but then they, they messed it up for us, and now we have this. We have what we're living in today. It, the way that we are living today is not, is not by design. And you know, the best thing that we can try and do is essentially give God glory every single day for what he does and who he is and what he has done, because I'll tell you this, church, that there is, there is good news in it all. Even though we're born in this, into this sinful nature and we're living in this world that seems crazy and we're living in this world that's hard to put up with and, and you're seeing road signs for political things left and right nonstop, especially last week, like you're seeing all these things that are frustrating. The good thing is this, is that Jesus, because of the cross, because of his love, because of God's love, we can be reconciled to him. We can worship him. We can live our lives with a rhythm of worship because he is worthy of our praise every single day, no matter what it is that is going around, on around us. You know, God knew that humankind would be messed up. He, out of love, he still created us, though. He still created us. God knew that we would have to choose life over death. He knew we'd have to choose his kingdom over a culture of this world or his kingdom over an eternity in hell. He knew that we'd have to make these decisions on a daily basis. So let's read from Ecclesiastes 3.11 real quick. It says, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from, from beginning to end. So church, worship is part of our design. It's part of our DNA. It's, it's why we were made, we were created for the purpose of worshiping God. And although you may not understand, you know, one of my favorite songs is Waymaker, and there's that bridge that says, even when I can't see it, he's working. You may not know what he's doing. You may not know what he's up to. You may not know or, or be able to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, as we would call it. You may not be able to see these things, but I'll tell you, what that scripture says is his, his word says, everything is made beautiful for its own time. So in the meantime, when things seem slow, when things seem frustrating, at the very least, what you can still have is a time of worship and growing closer to God. You can still worship him. And, and, and here's the good thing. You can be confident that God hears you when you worship, you can be confident that he's listening to you and that you can speak to him and that he'll respond to you because it says this in 1 John 5, 14. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask anything that pleases him. And we've already read that what pleases him is, is the fact that he created us and he created us for worship. Listen, you could be hurting, you can be sad, you can be emotional, angry, frustrated, anxious. You could be happy or ecstatic or overjoyed and, and thrilled about something. Whatever emotion that you want to think about, life can be crazy and difficult. Life can be easy for you. But in all of that, you can be confident and know that he is, and he's always with you. He's always right beside you. He's always, he, he is always there listening. Uh, because when we have a rhythm of worship and that lifestyle, that's what pleases him. That's what pleases him. John 4, 23 through 24 says this, But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him, with, uh, worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, God is looking for us to go back to the heart of what he created us for. 
He's looking for us to go back to the heart of it. Let's, let's talk about worship for a bit. You know, worship, it goes beyond the songs, the three songs that we sing here at the beginning of service here. It, it goes beyond the songs that you, that you hear when you turn on the radio onto, into Bright FM or the local Christian station or your Spotify account or whatever streaming service you use. It goes beyond those, those songs that we would call worship songs. You know, when, uh, if, you, if you study it, what the word worship in the Bible, you'll come, you'll come to find that there are nine Hebrew words and seven Greek words. At least, it, we may be missing a lot. There are nine Hebrew words and seven Greek words that we translate as worship. And uh, these words essentially just, they, they try their best to grasp this concept of, of, of uh, what God called us to. They try their best to grasp this concept of what our purpose is, uh, this thing that we call worship. And there's, there's words like this. It, it's translated bowing, kneeling, lifting, serving, sacrificing, praise, singing, playing an instrument. All these, these words in the Greek and Hebrew, they're just trying to explain a concept to us that we, we should try our best every day and seek after, uh, pursue understanding what it is. You know, when we talk about worship, we talk about, when we talk about it as a rhythm of our life, or worship just in general, essentially you can, you can define the word worship as this. It's ascribing worth to God. You know, we tend in our daily life to ascribe worth to a lot of things, ascribe value to a lot of things. We, we value our jobs, we value our cars, our careers, we value social media. Some people value their, their, their social media accounts, and you may be thinking, that's crazy, Pastor Mike, I would never do that. I, I'm, I'm not that way. I, who in here would be willing, if, especially if you have an iPhone, I know there's a way to do this on iPhone, who would be willing to let me look at your screen time to see how much time you spent on social media? This morning before church, and I, I, know, I know Mike would, because um, he's like, I don't use social media hardly at all. Anyways, there's, there's very few people. Some people are like, man, I know you can't see it because I've spent four hours this morning scrolling through TikTok. I, was, I only went on there to go you know, through a couple of videos. But people ascribe worth to social media and to technology without even realizing it. I mean, think about it. How many times have you been in a conversation with someone and all of a sudden your phone buzzes and you pull it out and you're like... Well, let me respond to that real quick. And now this person on the other side of the phone uh, on, that was in a conversation with you is going, okay, I'm not valuable. That person is more valuable for sure. You ascribe worth to things and value to things without realizing it. And I have to be honest with you. There's been times during worship here, during our, our worship times, when we're singing praises to God where I've looked out into the congregation, I've looked out into the seats here, and I've seen people look at their phones. They, I've seen people actually answer phone calls too. I want to ask you, is talking to so-and-so that you haven't talked to since college more important than you expressing love and value to God? True worship is this. True worship is our response to God's love. It's our response to God's mercy and grace. It's our way to express to God that only he is worthy. It's a lifestyle of following, pursuing, and prioritizing God in our lives. True worship embraces obedience and aligns us with God's heart and his purpose. True worship is defined by the priority we place on who God is in our lives and where God is on our list of priorities. This is what it says in Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So I want to ask you this question. Where is your worship pointed? If you were to really, you don't have to answer out loud because that could get awkward quick. But where is your worship pointed? What rhythm of worship do you have? Is it one that worships God or one that conforms to the world, to, to what you see in culture? Is it one that's transformed by God, like the scripture says, or is it chasing after his will and his plan and his purpose for you? Or is it, is it one that's chasing after what the world says looks good and feels good and tastes good and is good? Because I can guarantee you that's a lot different than what God says is good and perfect. When we talk about rhythms of worship, there are a few things that are on your note sheet if you grab one of these note sheets on your way in. Uh, there's a diagram at the bottom. I'd encourage you not to look at that yet because we'll get to that in a bit. You'll be distracted by that. So just, uh, but when we talk about rhythms of worship, there's a few things that I want to point out is that a rhythm of worship helps us 
to redirect our adoration. Adoration is a word that's not used a lot nowadays in culture, but adoration means a deep love and respect. It also it actually has a definition that says adoration means worship. It means veneration. But in other words, there should be a deep love and reverence for God, such a deep love that we continually direct our worship towards him in everything that we do. You know, last year, a good friend here at the church actually uh, gave me and Michelle a gift uh, to go to a, a, a Ravens game. And I was like, sure, we'll go. We've never been to an NFL game. That'd be a lot of fun. But I, I'll tell you, I was super overwhelmed when I walked in and I, I, we'd walked into the stadium and that was fine. Getting in wasn't that bad. But all of a sudden, it was like 5,000 people came out of nowhere. And I'm walking and I'm like, all right, you're in my way. Let me go around you. Now you're in my way. Just constantly people. In my, I was overwhelmed with too many people getting in my way. And then I was overwhelmed when we got to the seat finally. I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, these people are so loud. They've never even met these people. They're so loud. They love this. Now they were playing the Colts, so obviously there's some tension there. Does anyone know about that tension? If you don't know, just find a Ravens fan. They'll, they'll get mad and they'll tell you about it too. Uh, but they, there was some tension, so it was, it was a little bit more excitement. But I was overwhelmed at how, how people were so uh, expressive and how much they liked what was going on on the field and liked these people, whether it be a good play or a bad play. I was also... I'm also blown away at, like, if you, if you really think about, uh, let's, let's think about a celebrity. You think about whatever celebrity you want. I'm not going to name any. Uh, or someone, maybe not even a celebrity, but someone popular, right? Someone that you've been following for a while. Maybe you follow everything they do, and you're like, oh, I want to meet that person one day. How many of you would meet this person or see them and be like, oh, man, my, my knees are weak. I can't even walk. I, my, my mouth's dry. I can't talk. People, you get starstruck, right? A lot of people get starstruck over these people that are just other ordinary human beings. They're nothing, they're no different than us. They just, more people know who they are and what they do, and that's it. They're starstruck. When was the last time that you can remember thinking about God and his creation and his power and being in awe the way you would over a, a, a popular person, a celebrity or an athlete? When was the last time that you felt like that towards God and his creation? And Romans eleven thirty three says, Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. I like the way the ESV translation says. It says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how instructable are his ways. Oh, the depth of riches. You know, when I think about, like, knowledge and wisdom, I, I think there's, there's a, if you really think through it, there's a, there's a deep sense of knowing something like in a, you can know it in a deep way you can know it in a wide way this is literally saying there's the, the the depth of the riches and wisdom to me when i read this i'm like man that that tells me that god is is thinking awesome he, he's powerful he, he's we should be in awe of him church we should be in awe of him we should stay in awe of him you know if you're wondering what it means to be in awe of god it means that you have an attitude of worship and admiration towards him all the time every single day this is what it says in Psalms 95. It says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people He watches over, the flock under His care. If only you would listen to His voice today. To redirect your admiration to Him, I want to give you a couple of tips. It's not on your sheets, but you can write them down if you want. But simply this, you spend time in His Word, you spend time talking to Him, you spend time worshiping Him. And then at the end of the day, whenever you're done with all, the, all three of those things, you actually stop what you're doing and hit the pause button, get in the place where you can be still, you can be quiet, and listen for his voice. Because I can guarantee you he's talking to you. I can promise you that he wants you to hear his voice. A rhythm of worship helps us to do this also. It helps us to redirect our focus. You know, earlier today I, I was talking about rhythms and routines, right? My routine, what it is. I'll, I'll be the first to admit I get distracted pretty easy. Uh, I was actually talking to, to, I won't tell you who it is because he's probably watching online, but I was talking to someone at the men's retreat, and I was like staring off. I was making a statement, and I was looking at this wall, and I looked up, and there was a, some windows up there that were painted with black, and I immediately stopped what I was saying, and I was like, oh, they used paint on those windows. That's weird. 
And then I went back to what I was saying. In other words, like a squirrel moment, right? I, I get super distracted really easy. I'm the first to admit that. But I can focus when I need to. But at times, you know, I have so much on my agenda because I have so many things that I want to get done every day and make sure that I do well that, that I feel like life can be noisy. You know, it can be hard to sit and be still, which is why I like hunting a lot, which, by the way, I'm wearing camo in light of hunting season. Can you all see me right now? You probably can't see me, so I'm just a floating head, right? So, you know, being out there in the woods is perfect for me because I get to stop what I'm doing and be still. Because if I'm not still, I'm not going to see any deer. They're going to see me way before I ever know they're even around. But I get to hang in a tree and literally just be still and pray and listen to God. You know, but talking about distractions, you know, I think that for most people, and even myself, the, the first thing that we overlook in our routines and our rhythms, the, one of the first things that we do is we, that we drop in our day is we stop reading the Bible and we stop praying. Because what happens is you go, you pick it up or you look at it on the table and you're like, oh, I was only going to read a chapter today. You know what? I, I really have to go. I, I'll read that a little bit later this afternoon. And next thing you know, the afternoon's passed and it's dinner time and you're like scrambling. Oh man, I didn't, I didn't read that today. And you're like, I got to get dinner ready for the kids. It's fine. I, I'll read it when I, when I go to bed. But by the time you get to bed, what happens? You're exhausted because you finally got your kids to sleep and they finally stop popping up out of bed and running around the house. And now you're going, ah, I'm too tired. I'll do it tomorrow. And then the same cycle happens and now that becomes your rhythm. The same thing happens with prayer. That's the common thing that people drop like that. Well, I learned, I, I, was, I was in a program where I was studying leadership and management for a while and one of the things that I, that I studied, I read an article that, had talked about focus and, and attention span and stuff like that, right? It takes, did you know it takes 23 minutes and 15 seconds for the average person to get refocused on the task that they were doing when they have a distraction? Now, this was back in like 2016, 17 time frame when this was studied, when this study was done. I can guarantee you now it's even shorter time than that because we used to have what we call what the, the microwave society, you remember that? where it's like, or the fast food society where you want to get through somewhere within a few minutes and quit. But now we've got TikTok happening and you can't even watch a 15-second uh, you know, clip without just going, eh, and scrolling through. It, things have changed for attention spans. So it's probably less than that. But let's use that 23 minutes and 15 seconds and, and we'll think about it for a second. We, you're sitting there working. Let's say you're, you're at a computer and you're typing up something. You're working on a task or you're designing something, whatever you do for your, for your job. And you get a text or an email and you go, let me look at that. Let me respond to that. And let's just play and say it, it took you two minutes to respond, right? And then you, you're like, all right, now I'm done with that. Let me get back to my task. Um, I'm, I'm refocused. But really you're not because it, your mind hasn't fully engaged yet in what you're doing. You might think you're, t you're working on the task again, but you're not. You're, you're not fully engaged yet. So I'm typing again and I'm, I'm going at it. Before you know it, that's what, 25 minutes that have really technically passed by before you've, since you've really been fully engaged. And then all of a sudden, your coworker knocks on your door, and they want to talk about their weekend or something. And now it's, they've, let's say they sat there for 30 minutes talking to you. And then all of a sudden, you're like, all right, they're gone. Let me get back to it. I'm typing away again. I'm not fully focused yet. I'm not really in, in, engaged in what I'm doing. But now 78 minutes have passed by. I can guarantee you, if your employer knew this, they'd be pretty mad. 78 minutes have before you, since you've been fully engaged in the task that you've worked on, that, that you're working on. So let's imagine it now in our world that we live in, we're so busy and on the go constantly, we have so much on our plates that we don't feel like we have enough time in the day, right? Now, when I think about how easy it is to get distracted and how easy it is to be focused on the problems that we face and that our family's facing or that our friends are facing when we hear about them, I, I think back to Matthew 15, 8. Matthew 15, 8 says this. It says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Church, far too often, we say we love God, we say we're excited to worship Him, we're excited to be in here at, at church and worship with other believers, and we're excited to get home and spend time in His Word and do all these different things, but we get distracted by culture like that. We say these things, so but, but what happens is culture happens, what, whatever's going on in the world is happening. There's elections happening last Tuesday, you're driving down the road after church, now you're mad because you've seen the wrong signs on the side of the road that you didn't want to see, you know, this person is elected, you, you're not happy about that. Now, all of a sudden, you're totally distracted, and essentially what Matthew 15, 8 is saying is that you, you are saying all these things, you're saying you want to love me, you're saying you want to worship me, 
but you're letting all these distractions into your mind, all you're doing is lip service. You're just saying this. It's not your heart. A rhythm of worship helps us to return back to the, re- the reason why we were created. Helps us to remain in awe of him and it helps us to seek him daily. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Church, I want you to realize this, that you are not on this earth for you. You're not here for you to feel good about your own self. You are here because God created you us, all of humankind, to worship him. That's the purpose of us on earth. That's the purpose of us to be on, to have a calling, to have gifts and stuff, is to, to give that back to him and to worship him. Point number three today is that worship redirects our heart to his. Now I want you to guard your toes for a second, maybe put them under the chairs for a second, okay? If I have permission... I'm going to say it regardless if I have permission. But I'll tell you this about when we talk about worship, I have heard in the years that I've been in worship ministry, I've heard over and over again people complain about, oh, I don't like that style of, of music. I can't worship to that. Or, oh, it's too loud. There's no way I can worship here. Or that's not a hymn. I can't worship. You know, you, if you are complaining about something like that and unable to worship because of your own feelings about a particular thing, your heart of worship is twisted. It's wrong. It's, it's off. It's not why God designed you, not why God has you there. Now, I will say, the only, you, you can complain. Now, you can come to us, the, to the pastoral staff, and complain to us if you want. If it's like that, if you come to me with that kind of complaint, I'm going to be like, hey, you need to uh, probably spend some time in prayer, bro. Uh, but I will say, if there's something in, in it that's not biblical, that we're not doing, that, that, is, that is not scriptural, of course, come and, and point that out. But before you come and question something because of a song selection or, or a, it's not a hymn or it is a hymn or because of the volume, stuff like that, check your heart first. Because worship starts from your heart. It doesn't start from a particular song or a volume or a decibel reading or a metronome or a, a rhythm. It starts from your heart. I mean, so I, want, I want to talk about worship from a different angle for a minute. If you really pay close attention to what the Bible says, now, now take your sheets and look t- towards the bottom. There's a picture of the temple there. If you really pay close attention to what the Bible says about worship, there is a progression that you will notice. This progression leads you from the outer courts to the inner courts to the Holy of Holies. And in the outer courts, what, what would happen is this. There, there was a gate that led to the outer courts, and the priest would go up to the outer courts, and they would say to the people in the town, to the, to the whole area, they would, they would call out and say, hey, you guys are welcome in. Come on into the outer courts. And people would go in there, and they would praise. They would celebrate. They were all there for the same purpose. They were all there because they knew that there was a, a creator, a maker, a, a, a higher being that they all loved, and they all adored, and they all wanted to worship. So they all went to the outer courts. Everyone was welcome there. And and, and there's a few things that you would see in the outer courts. You would see the altar of uh, of burnt offerings and the laver or the laver. I I believe the altar was a symbol of sacrificing self. Essentially, in in our day and age, we would say it like this. We We would go to this altar to stop this mentality of, I have to look cool during worship. To stop this mentality of, I can't lift my hands during worship because... Other people will see me or other people around me. They're not doing it, so I don't have to do it. It would stop this mentality of self. You're sacrificing yourself. Now, the labor was like a mirror, not like what we see in the bathrooms, but it was like a mirror. And that that whole, it symbolizes an opportunity for you to reflect on your heart, to see what's going on in your heart, because you're about to go into the inner courts. Now, if you go into the inner courts and your heart's not right, what happens in the inner courts is not going to work out too well for you. Because what happens in the inner courts is, You've made your sacrifice and all that, and you go into the inner courts. The, the priest welcomes you in now through this door, and you're in the inner courts, and what happens there is you have this entire time while you're in the inner courts to, to, to grow in relationship with Christ. So there's some furnishings that are in the inner courts, too. In the inner courts, you would see, uh, you would see the table of showbread, which essentially represents God's provision in your life. They all represent a number of things, but the lampstand represents the light 
of the world, which is Jesus, that never goes out, and he wants his children to live in the light, obviously, not in the darkness. And then the altar of incense represents the, the, the intercession of Christ. Now, it can also represent Christ's work here on earth and his mediation for us. But I want you to see the significance of this. When you go into the courts, remember the Bible says in Psalms 100, verses 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Essentially what is happening there is the, the priest is, is welcoming every single person into the outer courts. Then there's another door that, that welcomes you into the inner courts. Now, everyone was welcome regardless of your past or your present or, your, or whatever's going on in your life to the outer courts because that's the opportunity for you to meet God, to, to sacrifice yourself. And then, of course, you go, you get welcomed into the inner courts to, to reflect on your relationship with him and to, to grow in relationship with him. But in the, the inner courts is where you would build that, that relationship with him. The inner courts is where you would commune with him and live in his light. The inner courts is where God would go to battle for you. The inner courts represents that place where your everyday life shifts from the culture that's around you to a lifestyle or a rhythm of worship. That's where your rhythm begins in the inner courts. Remember, it says this, and we read it already in Jeremiah 29, 13. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you'll find me. This is where you'll really find him. You'll really find him when you draw near to him at that moment when you're in the inner courts, and you'll really find him because when you, when you seek him, he says you'll find him. Now, I want you to see this too. At the, in the inner courts, some people call it the holy place, by the way, but there used to be this there was a gate going into the outer courts, and then there was a door going into the inner courts. Now, going into the Holy of Holies, there was a really thick curtain called the veil that was up. Do you remember that? Now, behind that veil was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, behind the veil was essentially the tabernacle. It's where you would go and really meet God. It's where you would go and you would be able to, to, to kneel at his throne this is the place where you, it's all about him. It's no longer about me. The inner courts, you reflect on yourself. You get your heart right. Now, the Holy of Holies, it's all about God. The best part about it is, is that this veil is gone. This veil doesn't exist anymore. You get to go to the throne on your own. It used to be that you'd have to go and make these sacrifices and have the priest do it for you, really, and the pastor, the priest, the pastor would have to, to mediate for you. The pastor would have to welcome you in and, and ask you, invite you in. You know, you all have a door on your own at your house, right? And what happens when, if I go to your house today and I knock on your door, which I'm not because I'm probably going to go to sleep, but I would go to your door and knock on it, and you're probably going to be like, ooh, do I let him in? Or do I ignore it and, th and act like I'm not home? You have an opportunity to ignore or, or, or to make me think you're not home or to, to welcome me in. Now, the priest used to have to welcome you into these different places, to the outer courts and the inner courts, and then go to the Holy of Holies for you. Now, you know, here's the unique thing about it, too. When the, pre, when the veil was there, the priest had to tie a rope around his waist and have a, they'd have a bell on it. The, the glory of God was so strong behind that veil that you couldn't even see in there. There was a smoke. The priest would, would go in there, and, and if, if there's, there's literally people holding this rope, going, if he is not clean, or if he doesn't follow instructions to the T, the instructions that God gave him, he's not making it out. So as soon as that bell stops ringing and that rope stops, stops moving, we've got to pull him out because we know he didn't follow instructions. He's dead. That's what would happen before. Now, you've been welcomed into a rhythm of worship by God, an individual rhythm where you yourself get to meet him at the, at the holy of holies as often as you want. You don't need us. You don't need a, the worship team or the pastoral team. You don't need me to go for you and do these sacrifices for you or go, to the, go behind this veil for you and into the holy. You don't need me to do anything for you. You don't need anyone to do anything for you. You just have to worship him and ask to meet him or he's at the mediator has already spoken for you. The mediator is Jesus, and you can have a lifestyle where you praise him, a lifestyle of worshiping him, a lifestyle of holiness. You're invited to this rhythm of worship on your own, a rhythm of, it's a life of loving God and showing him that he's worthy of our praise and our adoration. So church, as we wrap up this service, we always wrap up by, by, by having you ask this question so that you can internalize what we talked about, so that you can put it to application. I want you to ask yourself, what now, God? What now, God? You know, it, I, I want you to hear this real quick. If you come to a church and you expect a particular 
style of worship or anything like that, and you walk in and you just become a spectator because you don't like what's going on in the service, you're not worshiping. You're not a worshiper. You're a spectator, and you've just came to a karaoke Sunday, essentially. But that's, 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 that's the wrong heart. You know, when you position or align yourself with expectation of meeting God rather than just spectating, you can walk out better than when you came in. You, you can expect God to move, and you can know that God will move in your life, that he'll do things in your life. When you expect God to speak, you can, you, you can know and be confident that he's speaking. When you, I'll say this also. In a healthy relationship, you know that there's healthy communication. There's two-way communication is always happening in a healthy relationship. I'm saying healthy for a reason. In a healthy relationship, communication happens regularly. If you haven't heard God speak, could it be that you just haven't stopped, you just haven't shut up and listened for a moment? For a moment? Could that be the problem? Maybe you aren't quieting down enough or slowing down enough to hear God's voice clearly. Maybe you are in a rhythm of busyness instead of having a rhythm of worship. Maybe you are in a rhythm of complaining about everything around you and following the culture that's around you, a rhythm of chasing things that you think will make you happy. happy. But God didn't invite you to follow the world. Remember what we read earlier in Romans 12. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's invited you back to a rhythm of how you were designed, a heart of worship, a, a, a rhythm of worshiping him. And church, I want you to go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to sing another song. To, I want to invite you to have an opportunity to lift up his name, an opportunity to magnify him, to show him that he is worthy. So we're going to sing a song together. And I want you to forget about picking up your kids for a moment, forget about uh, the other people in the room, forget about every, everything going on in your life, really. Just give it to God. And in this moment, lift your arms up and let's magnify his name together. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we pray, God, that you would be with us as we lift your name. God, we pray that you would be magnified. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have a rhythm of knowing you in a rhythm of worship. In Jesus' name, let's sing together. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.